Sorry about that. <laughs> hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Tommy Reynolds and I believe we are broadcasting to not only my uh, social medias, but we are now also broadcasting to the Photography Show um, Facebook page. If you haven't already seen it, we just did a broadcast over on the Photography Show's virtual show. So thanks ever so much to the guys at the Photography Show for having me on. We're now kind of carrying on. We're going to do a little bit of repeat of what we've just done over on the uh, virtual show. So if you did miss the beginning, we're going to do a little bit of repeat of what we've just done. But this is going to be a much longer version of that. So we've, um, as I say, we're going to be going live to not only uh, my socials, but also Pixapro socials. We're also going live to the photography so shows socials as well. So the way we're able to do that is we're actually using a service called Restream. And so for full disclosure, this stream is sponsored by Restream. And this is the service that we are using to not only broadcast to my social media channels, but we're also using it to broadcast to um, my YouTube, my Facebook, uh, the Photography Show's Facebook page, um, Pixapro's Facebook page, Pixapro's YouTube channel. So you can go live to actually, I think, up to 30 channels simultaneously, which is amazing. So it gives us more chance of you guys seeing this depending on whatever platform you're on. Um, to celebrate this, I'm gonna be doing 20% off. So if you type in Tommy20. Yep, Tommy20. Tommy20 at the checkout, you can get 20% off of any of Restream's plans, but they do have a free one. So go and check it out um, at restream.io. So that's how we're using to multi-stream to all of these platforms. So let's get on to uh, today's uh, demo. Uh, so we're here at, back at Lux Studios and we are going to be doing the demo that I, I initially was planning to do back in March at the photography show. So I'm pleased that we've got Peter. Peter is going to be my model today. Peter was going to be the model again that I was supposed to have at the photography show back in March when it should have happened. So I'm really excited that we can have Peter along here today to do the demo that we initially wanted to do. So what we're gonna be doing is demystifying using more than one light. We're gonna start with one light and then we're gonna build it up to two lights and then to three lights. We're gonna be using a variety of different modifiers from the beauty dish to a snoot and we're gonna even be going on to something that's quite, quite different and that's an optical snoot. I'll tell you more about that when we get there. But first of all, let's start with one light. So um, I'm positioning Peter relatively close to the background and we're gonna be using, first of all, the beauty dish. Now, looking at the beauty dish, we're gonna start off using what I like to use with the beauty dish first, and that is when you combined using the grid and the sock at the same time. I really, really enjoy using this setup. When you use both, it gives you not only a nice contrasted light, but it gives you a nice um, vignette because it's kind of feathering off that light as well. So rather than being really harsh with the grid, which is fine if you want that look, but this is great if you are in a small studio. So if you're someone that uses a small space, using the grid and the sock together gives a nice contrasted light without it bouncing left and right. So let me show you what I mean. So let's set this up. So Tommy, looks like we've got quite a few people watching already from all across the world. Oh, Which lovely. Nice. I did, yeah, I should have said at the beginning, if you can hear me, by the way, we had a few technical issues when we did the virtual show. So if you can hear me, if you can see me, then do let me know um, because we had a few audio issues before. So let me know if you can see, if you can hear me and also let me know whereabouts you are in the world. We'd love to hear from you. And if you do have any questions, then just let us know because we've got Stephen over here who's going to be helping me out with all the questions. All right. So, to start with, let's start with the strobe. We are using a Pixapro City 600 Pro. What I love about this is the modding light that's on this. It's a really powerful light. It's, uh, and not only is the modding light powerful, but the 600 watt strobe itself is powerful. And of course it is battery powered. It's my go-to strobe when I am in controlled studio environments. And we know the, the modifier, it's a 55 centimeter beauty dish. Uh, the camera, I'm using my, my workhorse, it's my go-to. It's the Canon 5D Mark III. And we've got a, at the moment, we've got a 50 millimeter lens on it. We also, if you're wondering what on earth that is on the front of the camera, it's a Ricoh 400 ring flash. It's a ring flash that's attached to my camera and that will be part of one of the three lights that we're gonna be using today. 
I'm going to leave it off though. So what you see from this point on isn't the Rico. I'll let you know when we do switch that on. But for now, we're just going to leave it as is because it's a little bit fiddly to take on and off. So I've just left it on just so that when we are ready to use it, it's good to go. Right, Tommy, some feedback. Mm -hmm. Sound, audio, all good. Thanks, guys. Thanks for letting us know. Fantastic, guys. Thank um, you. We've got a Canon fan. Says, yay. Um, we have got people watching from all over the UK, Germany, Finland, oh, wow, um, America, amazing. Honduras. Um, plenty wow. of people in America wow. watching. We're doing really well. Fantastic. All right, well... No pressure then. Thanks ever so much for tuning in, guys. Um, okay, so we just lost my train of thought. So we got, yeah, the 5D Mark III. Um, this is an SP4 trigger from Pixapro, and we are tethering into Adobe Lightroom. I like to use Lightroom. It's my go-to when I'm tethering. It's also my choice of editing my images as well. If you, actually, um, if you actually look on the tether screen, this is what we captured right as we finished the virtual show. So what we're going to do is we're going to almost back, um, go backwards a little bit and we're going to start from where we, um, from just using one light and hopefully we should reach something like this uh, and, and over the duration of the demo and hopefully give, um, show a little bit more as well. So let's start with just the one light. So let's do a meter reading first. This is a Sekonic L308S if you're wondering what the, um, what the flash meter is. This is my go-to uh, ever since Gavin Hoey recommended I use one. Um, it's great, especially if you're doing photography demos live as well. It does help so you don't make too many mistakes live. Right, enough talking. Let's just take some photos, shall we? All right, so I've got this set up. Position it at around 45 degree angle. And let's just get a meter reading. Oh. Let's turn that off. Made that mistake the first time. So we're going to make sure all the, all the lights are off so we're only firing with just this one light. Let's try that one again. Okay, so we're at 4.5. I'm just going to actually increase the ISO. I'm at 125. I think I can still get a nice image at ISO 200. And now I'm at 5.6. Plenty more countries watching. Um, Bolivia, Canada, Norway, Denmark, That's India. Um, well, wow, yeah, global. Uh, Brazil, <laughs> Montenegro. That's, that's insane. Scotland, Ireland, I can't Wales. actually process that. <laughs> that's actually insane. Okay, so before I take the shot, again, we're not using this. This isn't switched on yet. I'll let you know when we switch it on. We're gonna just start with our one light first, all right? Okay, I'm at 1 60th of a second at ISO 200 at F4 point, no, 5.6, sorry. Okay, let's just take a test shot, Peter. Just make sure we're all going and the tether is working. Okay. Guys watching at home, can I just check, is anyone else having any audio issues or is it freezing at all in the picture? Lovely. Okay, so this is just using our one light. So we can see what's really nice about using that one light is not only is it lighting Peter, but it's also lighting our background as well. So if you are using just one light, a good tip is if you have your model relatively close to the background, then that's not only going to light them, that's also going to light the background as well. Because the light doesn't just stop here. There's also this tiny gap here where it can finish and give us a bit of an exposure on the background as well. Um, there is a technique called feathering, though we're not going to be doing it today. Well, we're not, not going to be doing it on a beauty dish. But if you look at my last live stream on my YouTube channel, you can see where we do talk about feathering the light. We feather the light using a softbox, but today we're using a beauty dish, so we're going to aim it straight at our model. It's better that you do if you aim it straight at your model and you don't feather with a beauty dish. So if you want to learn more about feathering the light with a softbox, then just check out my previous live stream where we demonstrated that. All right. Um, are we all right for technical issues or are we um, all good? Well, it seems we're getting a couple of minor freezes now and again, but most people are saying it's, it's back up and running and smooth now. Okay, cool. All right. Well, we'll just, we'll crack on. If uh, there are any other technical issues, just let us know and we'll see if we can sort those out for you. So looking back at the screen, this is just our one light. And if we zoom into the eyes, we can see the catch light there. That for me is my sweet spot. I kind of like that kind of half moon 
shape that we're getting in the catch light of the eye. That, as I say, it's my sweet spot. It's a good height for me. It looks, it feels very natural to me. If that was any higher, we would risk losing that, um, we would risk losing that catch light. And we can demonstrate that actually. If I do raise it much higher and then take the same shot again, so we've not changed anything, all the settings are the same, all we've done is just change the height. Okay, so if we zoom in, ah, okay, we still see in the catch light a little bit, but if we look at the overall result, it is much darker. We're losing some of the light in the eyes. I personally prefer the one we just took there. We're losing some of the de detail there, um, where it's obviously, um, where we're obviously lifting it much higher. So if we lifted that even higher, then it would be even more shadow. We would get even more shadows under the eyes and under the nose as well. So this is all personal preference though. Where you position your, your beauty dish or your softbox is entirely up to you. These are just my personal preferences. So I'm gonna just raise that down a little bit, a little bit more. Just while you're doing that, Tommy, I'm just gonna take the opportunity to remind everyone watching, if you've got any questions, please fire them across and we'll see if we can get Tommy to answer. Cheers, Stephen. Okay, so I also wanna show you the differences by changing your position. So if I go front on, we're gonna take one now where we're front on. Now I'm gonna take one step left and we're gonna take the same one again. And I'm gonna go even further left and take it again. While you're doing that, Tommy, could we please know what camera you're using? That's from Kirsty. Yeah, of course, Kirsty. I'm using a Canon 5D Mark III and there's a 50 millimeter lens um, from Sigma on there as well. Uh, I haven't upgraded um, to any other camera in a while. I've had this camera for, for years. It does everything I need it to do. Um, it still takes a great still. And it, yeah, as I say, it does everything I need it to do. I'd love the R5, who wouldn't? But at the moment, this does everything I need it to do. Um, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna upgrade something, I would personally well, upgrade what you don't have. If you've already got a camera, if you've already got a full frame camera maybe, instead of maybe thinking about buying a new camera, maybe it's worth thinking about buying that first softbox. So I always like to think of it like that. Buy what you don't have first and then upgrade later. So that's why lighting, I'm, I, I'm so passionate about lighting. That's why when I bought a softbox, I wanted to then buy a beauty dish rather than by upgrading my camera. So buy what you don't have and then go from there. So looking at those examples we've just taken. So that was when we're, we're front on. That was when we took one step left and that was two steps left. Now ignore obviously that we've got some set in the background, but looking at the shadows, looking at the differences in those images, all we did was take a step. Notice how much different these images look just by taking a step once left and then one and then two steps left you can really create some really different results without having to change the modifier all i had to do was just change change step if you wanted something even more harsh if you wanted something even more channeled and more focused you could take this sock off and give an even harsher light so if we do that now so if i swing this round mike so you can see here this grid. Actually, if I take this off, see if you can see this, Mike. Sorry, I'm gonna move you around. So I don't know if you can, you can see me there, Mike. And then if I turn, I then disappear. So that is what a grid is doing. When you, t uh, it's stopping the light from effectively going left and right. It's only channeling forward and it's stopping it from spilling left and right. So it's only going forward. So that's why this creates a really contrasted light. So if we put this back on and take another shot with the grid on only, we can see the difference between the shot we've just taken and when we've got the grid on. Right, so I'm just gonna throw up a message from Jason and he, he's saying that he has a light meter but doesn't wanna waste his time doing, using it on a photo shoot. He wants to know how to use it. That sounds like a perfect opportunity to plug your YouTube. How to, uh, how to light meter. use the light, oh yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so if you, wanna, if you wanna learn more about using a light meter, if for those of you that don't know what this actually is doing, when I press this button, I will then press the test button on my flash, which obviously then gives me a burst of flash, and that light meter is reading how intense that light is. And then it's telling me what aperture I need to put my camera to, to give me 
more or less the perfect exposure, quote unquote. It gives me, it gets me to the right, na uh, right neighborhood. It might not necessarily get me to the front door, but it gets me to the neighborhood, if that makes any sense. That made sense in my head, that analogy. Um, but if you want to learn more about using a light meter, then go and check out my YouTube channel where there is a video on three reasons why you should be using a light meter. And there I go into more detail about how to use one of these things. Okay. Okay, so if I take another meter reading, because now we've taken the sock off. So every time, if you have a light meter, every time you change your, you modify your strobe, your light, you are gonna need to re-meter your light because it will be different. So if you think about it, we've taken a layer of diffusion off of that light. If we've taken a layer of diffusion off, then that light is going to be more intense. So I know before I've even taken a photo that this uh, is gonna be, it's gonna be overexposed. So I need to accommodate for that. So I need to adjust my settings on my camera or I can adjust the settings on my, on my flash. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna take another meter reading George from Ashford would like to know what your uh, flash settings are at the minute. Flash settings are at the minute. Well, I'm just about to change them. At the moment, I was at uh, quarter power. And the reason why I was at a quarter power, which might seem quite a lot for a 600 watt strobe, but that's because it's going through the actual dish in the center of, a, of the beauty dish. It's going through the grid and it's going through the diffusion panel as well. And then it's traveling and giving me a 5.6 reading at uh, ISO 125. So that's why that you, we're using quite a lot of power. But now we've taken the diffusion layer off, we're gonna be using less power because it's gonna be more powerful. So that just gave me a reading of F13. So, it's, so that's actually cutting out quite a lot of light. So I don't wanna shoot at F13. I wanna get um, um, up a little bit closer to more 5.6. So I'm gonna change my flash from a quarter power. I'm gonna bring it down around two stops and I'm gonna try it again. So that's coming out at 6.3. So if I come down once more, F5. So I'm gonna to go to F5. So now I'm at 132 power, gone from quarter power to 132 power. So that's quite a lot of light that I'm saving, if you like. So that means the refresh time is gonna be a lot quicker and this flash is gonna last a lot longer. Just gonna throw up a question from Emma here because it's not one I think I've ever it's not the common one, let's put it that way. Um, she says, you obviously have your favorite backdrops. What helps you choose a backdrop? Is it just tonal connection with the model? Yeah, it's, that's, that is a really good question. Um, I guess, it, again, this all just comes down to personal preference. You can absolutely pick backdrops based on what the model is wearing. Absolutely, you can, you know, there's the whole color wheel where people will pick complementing colors. They'll have a color where um, the model's wearing one color and then you'll, have the backdrop that complements it. Some people will wear uh, colors where they're exactly the same as what they're wearing. Um, but for me and my work, if you look at my portfolio, the, it's very earthy tones, it's very kind of subtle colors. Like I don't use, I'm not like kind of a fashion photographer who might use very um, exaggerated colors. For me, my backdrop colors, if you look at my studio, I'm using browns, blacks, grays, um, maybe white, very rarely but those are kind of my go-to color choices because then it kind of goes with most colors. So again, we've, we've intentionally asked Peter to wear black because then it feels very subtle. So there's no kind of exaggerated colors. If we wanted to throw these images in black and white, it might look, I think it would look really nice because there's not any kind of distracting colors in this image. We're taking portraits, so we want Peter to come out. We're not, we don't want to be distracted by any kind of bright, vivid colors from the background or from what he's wearing. But this, of course, is just total preference to what you like. But look at, maybe look into the color wheel and color science, color theory, you can kind of go, go down a rabbit hole with this sort of thing. So have a look into that if you wanna try and find complementing colors with your backdrop and model. Okay, just take a swig of water. Okay, so this next shot, we're gonna take a shot now with just the beauty dish and the, um, with the grid on only, not with the sock. So we've taken the sock off. So let's take another shot. Okay, Peter, lovely, hold that. So we compare that cast. So actually we'll compare it with the, 
one that's more front on. So we compare that one with that one. So you can see very harsh, very dramatic. We go from that one to that one. You can see even though Peter is relatively close to that background, we're pretty much losing all of the light and not really seeing the backdrop at all on the right there. So that's what that grid is doing. It's channeling that light forward and it's not spilling left and right at all. Now, me personally, I kind of, I prefer when we have the sock on because it kind of gives me that natural vignette. We get that detail back here on the right side of the image versus the one we've just took where we lose all the detail in the far right. So that's the beauty dish. If you want an even more contrasted light though, then we're gonna turn and we're gonna look at the snoot. Tommy, while you're doing that, just for everyone who's just joined in, you maybe missed the beginning part, can you just walk us through what lights are on and what lights are off at the minute, just so everyone's clear? Absolutely, yeah. So if you are just joining us, welcome, thank you. Uh, today we are demystifying, demystifying using more than one light. We've just explored using a beauty dish and what that's like when you use the sock and when you use the grid only, or when you use the sock and the grid as well. So what we're gonna do now is we're now gonna put a snoot on and now we're gonna then introduce more than one light. We're gonna then introduce a backlight and then a fill light. And just to show you guys, if you are only using one light, it's not scary when you start introducing more than one light. If you've got a trigger system like I have or something similar, it is very easy to dial in your separate, your separate strobes and give them their own power so you can control them independently. So that's what we're doing here today. So if you are joining us now, thank you very much for joining us. We're now going to put the beauty dish away and we're now going to put the snoot on to give us an even more contrasted light. Okay, so the nice thing about the City 600 here is it's modeling light here that I did mention earlier. So if we look at this, if I raise it up, so the nice thing obviously about this is we can see exactly where that light's going to fall, which is especially important when you are using a modifier that's this, um, that's this contrast and this direct. Even on the front of this snoot, we even have one of those grids that we saw before, right? This is obviously a much smaller version. It's going through this snoot, it's traveling forward and it's gonna give us an even contrastier light. Contrastier, more contrasty light, that's better. <laughs> so we can see exactly where it's gonna fall, which is very helpful when you are using such a harsh light like this. There's another great question coming from Sarah. Yeah. If there is one piece of advice you could give to a beginner, what would it be? Shoot, 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 shoot. <laughs> Just keep shooting, because the more, the more you shoot, the more you learn. I remember when I was first learning how to use my camera in manual mode, and the way I learned was me and my friend Andy, we would go out and we would put our camera in manual mode and not put it on auto. We would keep shooting until we would figure out, why is it dark? So we would keep fiddling around with the settings until we figured it out. You know, years ago, I'm showing my age now, but YouTube wasn't around when we, um, when we were, when I, was, when I had my Nikon D40, that was my first proper DSLR. And there wasn't really anything out um, like YouTube. So we were just trial and error. And that is actually the best way to learn. Doing personal projects is something I'm very passionate about. And if you wanna see some of my uh, personal projects, then you can check out my YouTube channel at Tommy Reynolds, where you can see where I've done many trial and error. But if you trial, and it works out, then you can use that on a paying client rather than kind of getting bogged down and doing the same old thing over and over again. So keep shooting and keep doing personal work even when you turn pro, okay? Couldn't agree more, Tommy, and by the looks of the replies, quite a few people agree with you as well. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, so we've got a snoot on now. So now let's compare what this looks like compared to the beauty dish. Okay, same again, Peter. Okay, so my fault, I didn't do a meter reading. So we can see that that's a little bit darker. So all I need to do is come to my flash. I'm gonna select A because this is on A. I always like A to be my key light. At the moment we're at 132 power. So I'm just gonna bring it up maybe a, 
half a stop, quarter of a stop. So now I'm at one sixteenth power. Let's have a look at that. Same again, Peter. Okay, that's better. So you can see, very harsh, very contrasted. It pretty much is only lighting um, Peter's face and nothing else. Now, we are seeing, yeah, okay, so we are, but we are seeing a bit of shadow though that's falling off and hitting the back, background. I don't like that. So if you want to eliminate that, if you are using contrasted light, maybe you are using sunlight as well, and, you, and you're getting a harsh shadow on the background and you don't want that, then a good tip is just simply move your model away from the backdrop. So Peter, if I can ask you to lift your stool up and we're gonna come forward, we're just gonna bring the set forward a little bit. That's perfect. Great, awesome, Peter. Okay, so we're gonna try and take the exact same thing again, but all we've done is simply move everything a little bit closer towards the cameras here. So we're gonna take the same shot and see what we get. Same again, Peter, lovely. So, okay, looking at that. Okay, so ignore that we're seeing a bit of the set on the right there, but we're not seeing any shadow that's being formed from this light now. So that's a tip if you wanna try and eliminate those shadows that are hitting the background. That's all you need to do. Just simply bring your, bring your model further away from the background. But looking at that now, I want a bit of light hitting the background. Now, the only way to do that in this position now is to now introduce a second light. So this is now where we're gonna add a Pika 200 and that's gonna be hitting the background. And the beauty of doing that and, and introducing a second light is we can control these two lights completely independently. It's the same when you're using a reflector as well. Some people would like to use a reflector to bounce some light in the unlit side of the face. But if you use a second flash to use as a fill or to bounce back up, you can dial in the exact power and the exact amount of light that's kicking up into the face. So like here, we're gonna dial in the exact amount that we have hit in the backdrop. So if I just take this off to show you guys at home. So for our second light, we're using my go-to for traveling. So this is what I love to use when I go abroad, when I'm taking portraits abroad. This is a Pika 200. It's not the pro one, it's just the normal one. But what we have got on here is the round head. This is the round head attachment that comes separately. The ones that come with it is the bare bulb and also the speed light attachment. But what I like about using the round head is because of the shape, it gives us a nice uniform shape to the background versus the speed light attachment. So I don't like to use the speed light attachment when, it's, when there's no modification on it. But if I'm gonna be using it with, without any modification like we are today, then I like to use the round head. Another reason I like to use the round head attachment on the Pika 200 is the modding light is actually pretty good on here as well, which is again, important for what we're doing here today. And so that you guys at home can see exactly where this light's gonna be falling. As you've picked up the Pika, Tommy, and you've mentioned the modeling light, uh, Chris would like to know which one is better for a beginner to start with, using small flashes in the studio or having a proper studio lighting setup? Oh, so my first, who was that from? Uh, that's from Chris. Chris, um, the first lighting setup I ever had, I think it came to about a hundred pounds and that was for, it was a 40 by 40 softbox and it was a, it was a young Nuo flash, I believe. And again, that was, a, that was about 40 pounds. And then I had a, a Harnell trigger and it was, it, was a, it was a cheap trigger where I couldn't actually dial in the power. I had to physically go up to the flash and turn it up and then come back and then take a picture. And then if it wasn't right, I'd have to keep going back and forth, back and forth. Now, obviously trigger systems are now advanced and they're still relatively cheap. I know that Pixar Pro do a relatively cheap one that where you can dial in the power um, without having to jump to the strobe. So again, that would be really cheap. So I would, I would stick with speed lights. I would, I would use speed lights if you're gonna be starting out because not only are they useful for off-camera flash, but they're also useful if you are doing any on-camera flash, maybe at events or like weddings, for example, or just general parties. So even at, even at weddings, I will still use a speed light and I'll maybe angle it behind me. 
but then I would also use that in the beginning as my go-to for off-camera flash. In fact, I went to Sri Lanka. If, again, if you go on my YouTube channel and you look for my Sri Lanka vlog, all my portraits were taken with a 40 pound flash and a very cheap 40, 50 pound softbox. So you, you can get away with creating really good results with very inexpensive gear, all right? Thanks for that question, Chris. I'm just gonna throw up a different question now because I think it leads on nicely. Um, on. Paul has said that he doesn't own a 600, but he has three 200s. Are these results still easily achievable? Absolutely. If, if, if we're talking about this um, scenario, then yes, absolutely. So looking here, we're at 1 16th power on my 600. Now, my reciprocal mathematic isn't the best, but I would, I'm pretty sure that you would be able to easily with a, was it a 200 he had? He's got three 200s. Yeah, so with a 200, you would easily be able to achieve what we're doing here. Obviously, we're using a 200 for our backlight, so you know you'll be able to achieve that with the backlight, but 100%, you could achieve this with a 200. The only downside you might face using a 200 is the modern in light isn't as bright as the 600. So it might just be a little bit harder to guess where exactly those shadows are gonna be falling. But if you are in a much darker room, obviously we can't turn the lights down, otherwise you can't, guys can't see us. But if you were in a darker environment, then yes, you would be able to see where that Pika 200 modern light is falling on there. So you can 100% use three 200s. Absolutely. Cool, thank you. All right, so let's now fire up the Pika 200. So that is now hitting the background. So you can see we can position it exactly where we want. So we've got a great idea of where it's gonna hit. It is bare bulb, there is no modification on this at all. So I'm gonna get this relatively close. Okay, and we're gonna get a light meter reading. So this is where we start introducing our second light. And this is where using a trigger really comes into play. This is where we're dialing in um, the exact output from each of our flashes. So, as I said, that one is A. There's a big old A letter on this strobe, and that's telling us that that one is my key light. I always like to have my key light set to A. This one is set to B, and you can change this. I could make this A if I wanted to, but if I make this A, then both of these would fire at the same power, which we don't want. We wanna be able to control these independently. So that's why I've set this one to B, and then I can change B on here to be whatever I want it to be. To be, <laughs> or not to be. Or not to be. <laughs> so for everyone at home, um, anyone who's just joined us, Tommy's only onto his second light, so he's got his key light, and he's just doing the backdrop light now. The ring flash is not being used just yet. It's purely stuck on there because it's a right pain to take on enough. <laughs> that is 100% true. That is um, a few people have asked about um, the weight of it and carrying it around and um, <laughs> Andy's managed to answer the question for you and um, I won't repeat exactly what he said, but yeah, it's heavy. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> look at it. I mean, there is a reason you don't see an awful lot of people using this. It's got so many, what's the word? Um, there are a lot of disadvantages to using it, but not from the quality point of view, but from a practical point of view. You could put this on a tripod though. So if, it, if, if you are finding it heavy and stuff, you can put this on a tripod. But it's a little bit awkward, like, luckily I've got really small hands and I can squeeze my fingers in this tiny gap here and just get a grip. Now, yes, it is also very, very heavy as well, but the results that I get from this outweighs all of those disadvantages. I'm happy to kind of put up with, with uh, with the weight and all that stuff. Yeah, it feels very weird, but the results I get, I, I hope you will agree are worth it. Not many people will, but I hope you will because I really like it. I really like it. It's, it's something different. If, people are, if not a lot of people are using that modifier, then I wanna use it because then it makes my work stand out just that little bit more. Andy's come in and said it's a full upper body workout using that. <laughs> it is a full upper body. I don't need to go to the gym. That's uh, my lockdown routine was just lifting that 20 reps, three, three sets. <laughs> okay, so let's get a meter reading on just our backlight. Okay, we're at 3.2, so I need to bump that up a little bit. I'm at 164 power. I'm just going to bring that up. Okay, that's at F5.6. That's good. 
So now I'm at 1 16th power on our back, backdrop light, background light. Okay, so we now take the same one again, but now we're introducing our backdrop light. Okay, same again, Peter. Lovely. Okay, so looking at that, way too bright. Straight away, that's way too bright. Your eyes naturally go to the brightest part of the image. So that is way too distracting for me. So I'm just going to bring that down a stop. And we're going to take that one again. I'm going to do this one vertically. And we'll take the same again. OK, that's much better. Um, the bulk of the light is a bit left. So I'm just going to angle that a little bit right, just so it's more hitting the center of Peter. I'm actually going to go in a little bit closer. Now, by going a little bit closer, by actually pushing it in a little bit closer, that's going to make that backdrop a little bit brighter. But what I, the reason why I'm more so doing that is it's actually going to create more of a vignette. Where I'm getting closer, it's going to vignette a little bit more, giving us more of a, uh, an overall um, effect on the backdrop. So let's try that one again. Lovely, Peter. Okay, much better. That's exactly what I was uh, kind of hoping for. So we can see we've now combined two lights there. We've now got the uh, snoot up here that's given us our key light. And we've now got flash B in the background that's doing our background light. So now we want to add a little bit more of a fill light to this. But before I do that, I'm going to introduce a, a different key light. I'm actually going to go to the optical snoot. So this is another modifier that I use quite often. If, if you want to check out my YouTube channel, you'll see a full tutorial using this. So this is what the optical snoot looks like. I've used this for about a year now, and it's now become one of my favorite go-to modifiers. The reason why it's called an optical snoot, the obvious that it's got a bit of optics on the front of it. So at the moment here, we've got a a Samyang 85mm lens. You can put any Canon EF lens on here. Um, you can put a 35mm, you can even put a 16mm on here if you want. Depending on which focal length you choose will depend on, the, on what, how, how the gobos will spread and hit your model. So the gobos that you can get with this, you can get a variety of different shapes that you put in front of the lens which will actually change the effect and the shape that you get on the model's face. So at the moment here, I've got a slit. And this is hopefully going to create the effect that we saw at the very start, if you tuned in at the very start of this uh, demo. This is going to create the same effect as putting two black flags up next to each other, but we're creating it with just this little slit here. So that slots in here. And again, if you want to see more of a tutorial and more explanation about this modifier, you can find this on my YouTube channel. The best lenses to use for this are prime lenses. Um, so this one's a 1.5. So if you have a even if you have a nifty 50, 50 millimeter 1.8, that'll still be a pretty good choice to use. Okay. Okay, so if you can see on Peter there, we can see the effect that this light is doing. You can see just where we get that pocket of light hitting Peter. And if we adjust the focus on the ring, you can see that it might be hard to see from there, but it's going from a very straight line. And if we defocus the lens, it gives us more of a feathered effect. So if you wanted to create this very harsh effect without using an optical snoot, it would be very difficult because you would need to have it firing. So I remember I did this once where I was using cardboard boxes. So I had, had it going through apple boxes and then cardboard boxes at the end. And then there was a tiny little slit at the end just to create that really harsh edge. So it can be done. Um, it can be done on the fly. But what's nice about this is I can do it. It's all in contained in one unit. So to show you what this does, to give you a demonstration of what this does. We're going to just position it there. I'm just going to clamp these feet off. 
Okay, now let's take a shot. Uh, I'm going to change lens actually, so I'm going to change from a 50mm to a 100mm. Right, perfect question for you Tommy. Yeah. Um, this is from Dylan, what's the best camera for someone new to start out with? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to work at Jessup's and for those of you that don't know what Jessup's is, Jessup's is a, um, a camera store here in the UK. So I used to work at Jessup selling cameras before I became a professional photographer. And of course it was the most popular question that people would ask is, what's, what's the best camera to get? And it's so hard to answer because everyone's so different. And uh, it's a little bit cheesy, but it's kind of like Harry Potter. You, do, you don't pick the camera, the, the camera picks you. So for example, and I only know this because I used to work in a camera store, that someone would come in, pick up a, a Nikon um, D5100 and they would be like, really like this, it feels nice, um, I'd like the dials, it does everything I need it to do. Put it down and then a new customer five minutes later would walk in and be like, nah, don't like the feel of this, I much prefer a Canon. So it's very hard to answer that question. My advice would be to go to your local camera store and pick them up and just have a play with them and see what feels right in your hand and uh, whatever feels good, then maybe that's the brand you need to go for. Maybe go for the menu system as well. Going through the menu system is probably a very important thing um, because some people will prefer certain brands' menu systems over others. Me personally, I've used, I actually started with Nikon. I started with a Nikon D40, and then as soon as I saw video footage from a 5D Mark II, I instantly moved over to Canon because I shoot a lot of video as well. And that for me was when I moved from Nikon to Canon was when the 5D Mark II came out. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> I've, I've just got all kinds of weird pictures in my head now with, with cameras going, Nikon! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got, we've got mixed cameras up here in the room, but um, we've got, what do you shoot with, Stephen? So I've got the Sony a7 II. Not the R, just the 7.2. 7.2. Uh, uh, my sister at the back who's doing all, all of our cutting, she uses a Panasonic. Um, Mike, you also use a Sony. I use a Canon. We've got a behind the scenes. Alex over here, he's also using Canon as well. So we've all got our, our own choice. We've all got our preferences. It's whatever's right for the job and whatever, whatever's right for you. So I will opt to use maybe um, my sister's GH5 because it's got much better video aspects than the Canon 5D Mark III. It's a little bit dated now, to be fair, in terms of its video spec. So if I need something better video-wise, then I will use the GH5, because um, Cassie will let me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, let's move on. So we're gonna be using the 100 millimeter macro lens now. Um, so we've gone from the 50, we're now using the 100 mil macro and let's see the difference between. And we've also now changed to the optical snoot. So let's see exactly what the optical snoot is doing. So we can see that tiny little slit going through Peter's eye. So let's see what effect it's creating. So chin down a little for me, Peter, hold that. Just to confirm, we're still not using the ring flash, are we? Still not using the ring flash. We're still only on two lights. In a moment, we will be turning on the ring flash. We will be getting there, folks. Don't worry, we'll get there. <laughs> But we can see, looking at this light now, we've got something very harsh, very dramatic going on right now. And you can see that it's very, very, the, it's creating a very harsh line because of the optics, because we, we have a lens in front of that. If we took another shot, so I'm now gonna defocus that lens. We all good? Sorry folks, let me just unplug and then plug it back in. How's that, Cass? Is that all right? No, I can't see anything. Yeah. Just flickering. Is it just flickering? Try just um, move the HDMI cable. <clears throat> Sorry folks, just a couple of technical difficulties. Just trying to get the tether screen working again. Is it still flickering, Cass? Just try and plug it one more time and just... Um... Yeah, no worries. 
Are there any questions? <laughs> there are lots of questions. <laughs> Let's choose. Here we go. Um, I don't think I can do this person's name any justice. I don't want to offend you. Um, but if you must choose between portrait lenses, what is the one lens you would choose? And on the end of that, I'm going to say why. I quite often use, oh, it's so hard to pick one. I kind of bounce between two. Um, I kind of dip between either a 50 mil or a 100 millimeter as my go-to kind of portrait. I mean, if it's, if it's more headshots, maybe, then I would kind of opt between 70 to 200 millimeter. I think a good focal length if you're doing headshots. If you're using, if you're going a little bit wider, then I think you can get away with using maybe a 50 millimeter as well. I, th I think if you were to look at the catalog on my, on my Lightroom, I think you would agree that the 100 millimeter, which is the lens I'm using right now, that's the lens that I end up using far more than most. I think it's, it's quite interesting. I was having a discussion with someone the other day and they were saying 85 or 135. And they were a wedding photographer. It was a second camera and they were using a crop sensor. So a lot of people on Facebook, well, mm. you should have this or you should have this. And no one really addressed the fact that it was a crop sensor. So I think it depends on your camera and depends on the space you have to shoot. If you're using a crop sensor and you've got very little space, you, you don't want to be using 135 because you'll be on their eyes. Yeah, I, I th interestingly though, when uh, at, a, um, at a wedding, the 35mm is my is my favourite choice of lens. Mm. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you've got an opinion, guys. If you shoot weddings, what's your favourite lens? Because I, I had this discussion actually on the, uh, on the TogPod, which is the podcast that me, my friend Alex and Chris run. And uh, we were both saying, though, what would be your go-to lens? And we, were, and we said, well, what for? And when it's for weddings, it will be the 35mm. I think it's a very versatile lens. But if it's for portraiture, then it's more the 50 mil or the 100 millimeter, which we're about to use today. And I'm getting a nod, and I think we're, we're good. Whew, thank God for that, okay. Right, so going back to this. So we can see we've got a very harsh, harsh light. And again, so just to recap, that, that was because of the optics. What I've done, I think I've already done it actually, I've defocused the lens, so I've turned the focus on the lens. So it's gonna hopefully give us a very sharp image to something a little bit more feathered. We're physically defocusing that light. So if I turn that, and then we take another shot, not gonna change anything, everything's gonna stay the same. Take the same again, uh, chin down a little for me, Peter. That's lovely. Okay, oh, I need to turn my tether back on because we kind of re restarted Lightroom. So let me just try that one again, folks. Sorry about that. Looks like you're getting a little bit of signal interference. Um, Andy says... Yeah. 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 Okay, so I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, but we are going to roll on because we don't want... Well, we just don't want to end the stream right, right now for you guys. So let me try taking another one again. Okay. Okay, same again, Peter. That's awesome. Hold that. Great. Okay, so we compare those two folks. We can see the very harsh line, and now it's kind of almost opened up and feathered a little bit more. Now we've done that, we're now going to start introducing our second light, our fill light. And that's because if we look on the, on the unlit uh, side of the face and the shadows here, I want to open up those shadows a little bit. So that's where we start introducing fill light. And again, just to recap, this is the Ricoh 400 ring flash. I love this flash, it's my go-to for fill. I wouldn't use it as a key light, but I love it as a fill light. I kind of nickname it Mr. Fill, it's kind of my go-to. So I'm gonna switch this on, and we're gonna take some shots, and you're gonna be able to see what differences this is making in, con in conjunction with all of these other lights going on right now. So I'll switch this on, I'm at 1 16th power, that's just a random power. I don't know if it's gonna be the right power, but we'll see when we, um, when we take a shot how it looks, all right? Same again, Peter. Lovely, hold that. Okay. Okay, that's pretty nice. So you can see we're starting to, f we're starting to fill those, 
those shadows in. Maybe that's a bit too much actually now I look at this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn down the power on that fill light. I'm just going to turn it down a little bit, maybe one stop and take the same again. Lovely Peter. Okay, that's cool. So in terms of the correct fill light or correct power, there is no right or wrong. This is again, this is personal preference. You can go from a very dull power to a very almost one-to-one -one power. If I was to turn this up even more to give us a similar exposure to what our light is doing, in terms of lighting ratios, that is called a one-to-one -one lighting ratio. So if I just turn this up quite high, and you can see what it's doing in conjunction with this when we get it closer to the power that that's bringing it out. Okay, it's so the same again, Peter. Lovely. Now, I don't personally like it when, when it's looking like this. I personally like it when it's much darker and much more moody. It gives it more drama to the image. This would be closer to a more of a one-to-one -one ratio, but again, I, I don't personally prefer it. I, I prefer it when it's much darker and more moody. So I'm going to bring it down to where I was before, but we're going to now kind of play around with uh, Peter's expression and, uh, and kind of the general composition of the image. All right. So let's take... Okay, that's cool. So, so I'm going to bring it down again. All right, Peter, let's have you... So a little bit more shoulder this way for me. That's it. And now we just need to move this over. Again, this is really nice about having a having that modeling light, we can see exactly where those shadows are gonna fall. Okay. okay. And now I'm just gonna come down a little bit more so I'm not eye level with Peter anymore. Lovely, great piece. And we can see we're getting really harsh. Actually looking at that, I'm gonna bring that light down a little bit more just so we see more of a catch light. So if you remember at the start of our demo, I was talking about catch light and my personal preference so looking at that, I think that's a, we're a little bit too high. We're not really seeing the catch light hitting uh, Peter. And that was because I did say to Peter, chin down. So because his chin went down, that means the catch light went from there to being up here. So we kind of lose it. So we're now we're just accommodating for him and we're bringing it down a little bit. So we'll take the same again. Then I'm going to adjust up here. Don't forget, guys, if you've got any questions, fire away. Okay, let's try that one again, Peter. Lovely. Okay, so that's looking a lot closer to where I want it to be. So what I'm going to do actually now, Peter, is let's, let's turn you even more now. That's it. And then you're going to be uh, chin this way. That's it. And then chin down. That's it. Hold that. This was asked a while back. I can't remember who asked it, Tommy. How long have you been shooting for? Uh, since 2013 was when I officially became a professional photographer. I was, uh, I was working at Jessup's. I, worked at, I went to university. Then I was at Jessup's for a couple of years. And then I was made redundant and then was kind of not so much forced into it, but it gave me the kick up the bum that I needed to go out and become a freelancer at the time. So ever since 2013, so that would be, but yeah, about seven years I've been a, been a professional for. Okay, let's try the same again, Peter. That's lovely, hold that. And chin up a little. That's it. And then looking over here for me, that's it, hold that. Good, and then moving your head slightly this way, that's it. You have to be so precise when you're, when you're dealing with the optical snoot because the light is so channeled. Okay. Okay. Lovely, Peter, really nice. Just bring it over a little bit more. That's it. Lovely. And then eyes back up here, that's it. Let's see if I can actually have it streaking across Peter's face. So I'm gonna bring it over here. 
Getting uh, plenty of positive feedback, Tommy. Seems everyone's enjoying the stream. Oh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Where, where can everyone go to find you in case they're, uh, they're missing the link anywhere? Yeah, if you, uh, if you want to check out more of my work, you can go onto my YouTube channel, which is Tommy Reynolds, uh, just, just Tommy Reynolds. If you want to find me on Instagram, then you can find me at Tommy Reynolds 89. But if you want to see all of the behind the scenes stuff like this, then go on to my YouTube channel where you can see all sorts of fun stuff like this stuff. But live stream is really new for us, so we do apologize for any t technical difficulties. This is only the second time we've done and we've gone live like this. We want to give you guys the best production quality and there will be a YouTube video coming out soon of a behind the scenes of how we've done all of this stuff, okay? So do uh, bear with us, uh, that video will be coming soon. Okay, so I'm just going to, I might actually flip to the 50 mil. So I was using, there's an 85 millimeter on here. I'm just gonna pop this down. So now we've gone from an, a 50 millimeter, sorry, an 85 to a 50. And that is going to open up that slit even more. Cause I wanna, I wanna, I want it to come across more of Peter's face. So by opening up, by turning to a 50 mil versus an 85 mil, Hopefully it should spread across more of his face more. There, but yeah, I can see that will, that's gonna give us much more of a look that we want. Okay, I've defocused the ring as well. Let's take that same shot again. Okay, so I'm gonna increase my power on the key light, looks a little bit darker, and then take the same again. Okay, that's looking much nicer. Yeah, that's looking much nicer. So now we're kind of, we're now hitting more of his, of his face. We're now getting from, from left eye to right eye rather than kind of selecting which one. I might even streak it even more across his face. Just gonna throw another question up for you to answer, Tommy. Yeah. Uh, from CG Fraser, is Mr. Phil TTL? Mr. <laughs> Phil, is <laughs> Mr. Phil TTL. Could you use it in TTL and use flash exposure compensation on the trigger, especially if you're on the move? You absolutely, you could, yeah. Um, I, you could use TTL. Personally, I don't use TTL though. I choose to uh, dial it in manually, only because if you are taking a series of 20, 30 images and you're just tweaking the model's face ever so slightly, I don't want TTL to maybe like get it a third of a stop under or overexposed. And then that means that's more work for me to do in Lightroom later. Especially as a wedding photographer, I, again, I choose not to use TTL or um, auto mode or an auto, um, like a semi-auto mode, like AV or S mode, that sort of thing. I choose to dial everything in manually because the less time I'm in front of my Lightroom computer, the more time I wanna be out actually earning money. So the less time I can spend in front of my computer, the better. So that's why I, I prefer to dial everything in manually. And this is at 132 power on the Ricoh 400. Nowhere near full power. So you can get so much more out of this. This is obviously more powerful than the Pika 200. Um, it's obviously a, a 400 watt stroke. Okay, let's get a few more because I'm, I'm so, so close to where I want this shot to be. Uh, Peter, if you take, if you lean back a little bit. That's it, and then come this way a bit. That's it, let's try there. So it's a little bit more difficult for me today, folks, because we've got so much ambient light in the room. It's hard for me to see exactly where the, this optical snoot is falling. But that's the beauty of live, eh? And I can also tweak it as well. I can actually turn, turn it here. I don't know if you can see this, Mike, if I make it harsh. I don't know if you can see that. But if I turn it, you can see that I can tweak the angle. So it doesn't have to be straight. It can be wiping across his face. Let's, let's try that. So now I've got it to where I want, streaking across, and now I'm going to defocus it. Okay, and let's try that. Awesome. I'm going to defocus it even more. And then head this way a little bit, Peter. That's it. Lovely, that's beautiful. Now I'm gonna tweak the Rico to where I want it to be. So I'm going from 132 to 16 power. 
Okay, that's looking lovely. Eyes over here, that's it. Really, really nice. Beautiful. Good, gorgeous, gorgeous. Hold that, hold that. Lovely. Just every time you hear the click, Peter, I want you to just tweak it so your keyword is to fidget. Just slight little movements every time. That's it. Kind of imagine you're that Viking that we did back in March. That slight little look, that's it. Lovely, just those tiny different expressions really make such a big difference. Good, gorgeous, good, really good, really good, really good. Okay, now eyes to me this time, that's it. And now once back over here, hold that, hold that. And chin down. Beautiful, and hold it there. Great, really good, really, really good. It's exactly what I was after. And not one blink. You will not find a blink from Peter. <laughs> so that is how you combine all three independently. Just to prove a point, because I get this question a lot and I almost forgot about it. I'm gonna turn the key light off and I want you to see what that fill light is doing on its own. So I get that quite often and it just, just goes, to, goes to prove just how, how important this light is and what it does. So I'm gonna switch I could do actually do it on here. I can switch the light off. So I get the background light will fire, but the key light won't. So you'll see the background light, but you'll see what the fill light is doing on its own without the key, obviously. That's it. So you can see it's very, very subtle. You can just start to see a little bit of detail there and we get that specular highlight and catch light in Peter's eye, just ever so slightly. It's, it's so subtle, but that is how I like to use a ring flash and I believe it's what makes your images different. Rather than just using the key light on its own, I like to use this because it just gives it that painterly quality. It then gives me option in the shadow slider in Lightroom to kind of tweak rather than trying to push light that isn't there. I've got the Ricoh that's given me a little bit of light in the, in the shadow so I can tweak it if I need to in Lightroom later. I think that's about it for the demo. Are there any closing questions for us, Stephen? Um, there are quite a few, so let's have a look. Um, metering mode, what metering mode are you using? Metering mode, uh, good question. I am on center weighted. That's my um, go-to for pretty much everything, including weddings, centre-weighted. And focusing, are you manual, are you auto? Uh, are you I continuous? am auto-focused, but it's, it's the single point focus. On here, I think it's 61 AF points. Uh, so because you are shooting with a 100 mil macro, that's obviously very close in, the depth of field is gonna be shorter. I'm not gonna chance having it pick the focus point for me, so I specifically pick my single AF point. How do you feel about music while we shoot? I love music while I shoot. I always uh, say to, to the model, I always say, what would you like to listen to? It's always the model's decision what music we listen to. Obviously we can't today because we're doing the live stream, but yeah, I would always have music playing. Um, I think that's probably a good point to wrap it up. Yeah. Well. Guys, thank you so much for watching this live stream. I want to go around the room and say a few thank yous. So uh, first of all, thank you to Peter. Thank you, Peter, too, uh, for modeling for us today. If uh, we want to find you, Peter, on Instagram, you are Peter Rebel Walsh. Yes, all one word, Peter Rebel Walsh. Peter Rebel Walsh. And if we swing over to my left, so Stephen has been <laughs> sorting out all the comments and has been our general uh, tech. He's been on hand when we've had a few technical difficulties earlier. So thanks ever so much, Stephen. And no uh, we've got Mr. Michael Mowbray. I'm actually gonna, can I do this? Can I move it round? Uh, yeah, we, we've got <laughs> Mr. Michael Mowbray, who's been operating uh, one of the cameras. We've got Alex doing some B-roll, some behind the scenes for us. And of course, we've got my sister, Cassie, who's doing all the camera switching. Uh, and uh, we swing this back around. So, Guys, thank you ever so much for watching. Uh, just, to, just a reminder, we have been multi-streaming this broadcast to not only my social media, 
but also Pixapro's social media and the Photography Show's Facebook page as well. And we've been able to do that using Restream. Uh, Restream is great. It allows me, as I said, you can multi-stream it to more than one platform. You can, I believe, 30 plus different social medias, which gives us more opportunity to see um, and hear from you guys, depending on whatever platform you choose to listen to us from. Um, I really love it. And if you want to try Restream, then I am giving you 20% off if you use my code TOMMY20 at the checkout. And that will give you 20% off of any of Restream's plans. But do check them out because they do have a free plan as well. You can find the links in the description below and affiliate links of pretty much all the gear that we have used here today. That's about it from me. Thank you ever so much for watching, guys. If you liked it, please give it a like or a share button or hit the share button or subscribe if you are watching this on YouTube. And as always, uh, we'll see you again next time.